Come ye that love the Lord, and let our joys be known. Join in a song of sweet accord, join in a song of sweet accord, and thus around the throne, and thus around the throne. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to see who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound, and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. To fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Pastor. Amen. Good to see you. Good singing tonight. I was giving a, I was telling them to turn the, the sound down, and I was going like this, so I hope none of you took offense. I wasn't telling you your singing was bad. I, I don't know. I was looking at Tom and doing that, so I hope he's not offended back there. But um, no, it is good to see you tonight. Glad to see everyone. Miss Linda, good to see you here. And of course, we're all praying for Brother Harold. And uh, we prayed a lot for you guys. And God's going to do a great work there. And I'm sorry? He's in room 56 at Bethel Point, right? Bethel Point. And we can go and look, talk to him through the window, correct? Okay. All right, well, we'll definitely get out there and uh, do that. Wonderful. Good to see everyone else here tonight. Let's open with a word of prayer, and let's begin this service. Brother Houston, would you have prayer for us tonight? Amen. You may be seated. Um, tonight, our church focuses on worldwide missions, and uh, I like to read the letters as they come in. So as we receive them, we read them. And um, I wanted to read just a little bit of the uh, Hebert family. They are in uh, Toronto, Canada, and um, we're going to read just a little bit of what's going on in Canada. The leaves have turned colors, and the air is getting crisp, uh, cooler each day, which means fall is upon us. We are now in month seven of what we thought would be a short three months uh, hiatus until we return to normal. Despite the looming threat of a possible second lockdown, now this was uh, in uh, October, so this, I'm reading it a little late. We are in fact now on our full schedule once again. Uh, they were able to start their midweek teen program, and currently they are studying 13 of the Bible's most notorious villains. And the purpose being that we would learn that our choices have consequences. And uh, they're uh, looking forward to uh, seeing everything go back to normal. Um, uh, he's saying here, people are still pretty cautious with the COVID-19 hanging around. It's obvious that some people are tired of it. While I was out on a walk at a local trail, I was able to take time to witness to an elderly man, I'm not going to pronounce his name, uh, from East uh, Prussia. Uh, he was pretty set in his ways and had some strange views about God, 
but I was able at least to plant the gospel seed. And uh, so he's asking prayer for this man. Uh, pray for the tracts that they've been giving out. And also pray for him and his wife. Uh, they're getting ready to put together a Christmas program there uh, for Brian and Liz. And uh, so be in prayer for the A Bear family. We'll put their letter out there. And I do hope you read them. Um, I was given this this week, and I wanted to read this. Many of you pray for our missionaries. I believe that. Um, but sometimes it's hard to know what to pray for them. And I was given this guide to praying for missionaries uh, yesterday, and I thought it was really good. Let me just give you a few pointers uh, when you pray for missionaries. Uh, pray for, number one, the missionary's own relationship with God. Um, that they would be put aside from malice and guile and hypocrisy. And uh, just things we pray for one another, but pray for the missionary's relationship with God. Number two, pray for the missionary's physical and emotional health. Um, many of these missionaries are in foreign countries. The weather's different. The food's different. And uh, many times they're more susceptible to disease than we might be. So we pray for their physical and emotional health. We pray for their family, the husband and wife's relationship, the children. We pray for the missionary's ability to communicate. Sometimes there's a language barrier. Uh, so that's one thing you can pray for them. We pray for their ministry. We pray for their relationship with fellow workers and uh, pray for the country of service that they're serving in. Just a few thoughts as you pray for the missionaries, things that maybe you could bring up. And I might um, look into printing one of these off here and uh, giving them out if you'd like ideas on how to pray for the missionaries. Um, but we'll look into that. All right, take your hymnals. Go to hymn 173. 173. Songs, channels only. We'll sing the first and the last verse on this. How I praise Thee, precious Savior, that Thy love laid hold on me. Thou hast saved and cleansed and filled me, that I might Thy channel be. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power. Flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. Jesus, fill now with thy Spirit. Hearts that full surrender know that the streams of living water from our inner man may flow. Channels only, precious Master, but with all thy wondrous power flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. Pastor. All right. Ushers, why don't you go ahead and come forward? Um, this uh, next week, we're going to put this in the Sunday Bulletin, but next week, our midweek service, because of Thanksgiving, and I've heard a few of you are traveling out of town uh, that Wednesday, so next week we're going to do the midweek service on Tuesday night. Uh, at 6.30. I hope that works for everybody. Um, that, I know some people are traveling, heading out. I hope I didn't inconvenience too many of you. Um, but I, I meant to put that in the bulletin last Sunday, and I never told Miss uh, Tony uh, about that. So, uh, but I'm sorry? It's in for this coming Sunday. Okay, good. We'll have that in there. And of course, this Sunday is the Thanksgiving dinner, and I'm looking forward to that and a time of fellowship, and uh, going over what God's done for the year. Um, since I've been here, it's, it's, it's kind of strange to say this, but honestly, it's been one of the best years in almost every category for this church in a lot of areas. A growth, spiritual growth, actual physical growth in the church, and, uh, and I'll share more of that because I want you to see how good God's been through what we would consider one of the most hectic years <laughs> 
Well, maybe some of you can remember worse than this, but uh, through one of the most hectic years for sure that I've ever been through. So I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. Lord willing, we'll have a PowerPoint, and then we'll eat and have a good time together. So let's have a word of prayer, and um, we'll take up the offering. And then just during the offering, we just come up and lead the next song, and then we'll start to take prayer requests. So uh, Brother Sean, ask God to bless the offering tonight. Hey, we're going to sing 345, Grace Greater Than All Our Sin, 345. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there with the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. On the second, sin and despair like the sea waves cold threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Let's sing that last. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. All right, wonderful. Take your prayer list tonight. Hey, Brother Daniel, I forgot to turn these lights on. Could you turn them? Oh, it just feels dark up here. Um... Wonderful, wonderful. A lot of things we're praying for. Um, I have a few on my, my phone that I need to bring up. Um, how many of you are thankful that we can pray? Aren't you glad for that? i just fascinated at the fact that we can come to the Lord in prayer. And even more than that, we can come as a church to pray. I think sometimes we take that for granted, and maybe one day we won't, but... Um, this is a precious time. I hope it's more than just 20 minutes of your night or an hour of your night. This is a big deal. And um, tonight we're going to pray. I hope you pray for our senators in our state uh, for the next while. I'm sure they'll be fighting for freedoms and uh, eventually religious freedom. And uh, so it is very important. Um, we're going to be changing some of our prayer night on Wednesdays as uh, we progress into next year. Some things we're going to do differently. 
And we're going to try to use the screens a little bit more and pray directly. But anyway, we'll get into that next year with a couple things. So what are we praying for tonight? Um, uh, Joe. Rick Cobb. Okay, let's pray for Rick Cobb. He lost his father and uncle. Okay, Miss Connie. Yes. Okay, so be in prayer for uh, Dallas and Miss Barbara's uh, brother-in-law passed away, so be in prayer for their family. Um, Dean King uh, had this virus and got sick, and um, it sounds like she's doing better. And uh, so continue to pray for her health. And then Candace, um, they're still trying to figure out what's going on, so pray uh, for, for this doctor's appointment. Uh, some of you know what she's going through, and you know this is a pretty big deal that this is finally going through. So really pray for um, someone else. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and that was your... Okay, I was going to say I thought it was a cousin. That's your cousin or your mom's cousin? It'd be both. Okay, good enough. All right, so pray for uh, Rachel's cousin. Who has the virus? And then pray for um, the Bogle family. Miss um, Bogle sent me a text that her uh, daughter-in-law's mother and dad have the the virus. Her dad is holding his own, but her mom has pneumonia, and they just took her off the oxygen. Um, so it's just a matter of time. That would be. Um, Mary Bogle's son's wife's parents. So be in prayer just for the Bogle family, if you would. I know you wouldn't know who they are, but that family in particular. But just pray for the Bogles. All right. Anything else, Miss Renee? Yes. Okay, pray for Renee's family losing her aunt. And then pray for Renee's dad's family for salvation for some who may not know the Lord as their Savior. Right, John? Okay, John's praying for the He's in the National Guard, and he needs this bonus to come in that they've been telling him he would receive. If we could pray for that. All right. Is there anything else? Yes, Jim? Amen. Even with her jokes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, amen. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, Travion, the young man who comes, the teenager, his mom's been in the hospital. Would you pray for her? Her name just slipped my mind. Anyway, pray for Trey's mother. Jeff? And for who? Russell Moore, yes. So continue to pray for Charlie and Russell Moore. 
All right. Is that everything tonight, John? How many of you have unspoken? Okay. Twenty-four. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, pray for this uh, police officer in Batesville. Let's do pray for the police in general. I know it's a rough time. I know we have friends and our officers, so let's pray for them. Miss Carolyn? Okay. Yes, pray for Ray. Um, he doesn't complain very much. But um, I know he is struggling with the arthritis, so do be in prayer for him. Okay. Anything else? All right. Brother Bob, is your back doing okay? Good. Because I'm praying for that. Amen. All right. Okay. Let's take our Bibles. Of course, let's continue to beg God for the country. And uh, these are... These are good days to be alive, okay? It's a good thing. God's in control, and we get to exercise faith in a rough, sometimes different situation than what we're used to. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how we can just serve God and show faith. But one thing I've, I've been just overwhelmed with is the Word of God um, lately and comforting. And uh, I read through Psalms 119 a while ago, and... I didn't think I was going to do this. We started with verse 17 through 24 last week. I wasn't going to continue, but I just, uh, I, I think I'm going to share these next few verses. So go to Psalms 119, if you would, tonight. Psalms 119. You remember the author, David, puts this into 22 sections. Uh, every letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Um, when I was in Bible college, I had to memorize uh, this whole alphabet, and I did much better in Greek than Hebrew. Hebrew was tough. Um, but this is the, the fourth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, um, Daleth. If I'm correct, it's a line this way and then a line this way. If I'm correct, I hope I'm, I'm right with that. But that's the Hebrew uh, letter. Um, he is celebrating, David, the author, is celebrating the Word of God. You remember last week we said, not only as a gift from God, but as a guide for his life. Not only as a gift, but as a guide. Uh, the only constant David had in his life was God and His Word. Remember, we talked about that last week. And uh, was it verse 17? Deal bountifully with thy servant. David recognized that even through a time of difficulty, he still had God as his constant and His Word as truth. Um, the Word of God brings a desire for prayer. And I believe prayer brings a desire for the Word of God. They're both aligned with one another, um, prayer and the Word of God. The Bible is God's authoritative Word. Let's not forget that. That is the truth. You have to be settled in your heart that this is truth. This is vital. This is important. This is something that will never let us down. It is constant. It is sure. Okay? The Bible is God's authoritative Word. When God speaks, He does not mumble. The Bible is not a book, listen closely to this, the Bible is not a book of helpful hints for happy living. Don't get me wrong, the Bible will help you to have a happy life according to His will, but it speaks with authority. And in these, this chapter, the word uh, law is used, 
and we'll go into some of these definitions. The word uh, te testimonies is used, uh, I think, over ten times in this chapter. The word ways is used, precepts, statutes, commandments, judgments. The word word is actually used. Uh, faithfulness, righteousness, and we'll go through some more of these, uh, Lord willing, in the next couple weeks. But let's look at verse 25. We're going to read down just this section through verse 32. And we're going to see tonight what I think is a holy desperation. A holy desperation from David. Look at verse 25. The Bible says, My soul cleaveth unto dust. Quicken thou me according to thy what? According to thy word. Um, this is the word in its general term, emphasizing the fact that God has spoken. Notice verse 26. I have declared my ways, and thou heardest me. Teach me thy what? Thy statutes. Statutes would be the idea to engrave in stone the permanence of Scripture, if you will. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts. So shall I talk of thy wondrous works. My soul melteth for heaviness. Strengthen thou me according to thy word. Remove from me the way of lying. It seems verse 29, he categorizes the problem, why he was in uh, dust earlier in the chapter. Remove from me the way of lying, and grant me thy law graciously. Notice what David does in these next three, three verses. I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. I have stuck unto thy testimonies. O Lord, put me not to shame. I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. The last part, I, I believe when he's enlarging his heart, he's giving him wisdom. He's giving him more things to put in there. And we'll discuss that just a little bit. The Bible is God's authoritative word. In the first verse, we don't know exactly where David's at. We don't exactly know what David's going through. But the first phrase of verse 25, My soul cleaveth unto the dust. It seems David is at a point where he's dry in his walk with God, if you will. Maybe he's drifted a little bit. I don't exactly know what David's going through, even though verse 29, he seems to point to the fact uh, he had uh, gotten to some lying of some sort, some type of deceit. He tells God, remove from me lying or deceit, if you will. But for some reason, David is going through something. And I want to encourage you. Um, there was a story I, I, I read a while ago, um, an illustration a preacher gave. Uh, there was a family that went to the ocean. It's just the family was going to go, and they, they rented a little uh, inflatable boat to use just for recreational use with the family. Well, the mom got in the boat, and she just laid back and was going to relax for a minute and just float as the kids and the dad were playing, and they were up along the sand somewhere. And eventually she wakes up, and uh, she opens her eyes. She feels it hasn't been that long, and she puts her head up, and by now she's drifted out hundreds of yards into the ocean. The water is getting a little more choppy in the area, and she starts screaming for help. Well, the dad is the only one that hears her, and he takes off into water to get out there, but all of a sudden the boat uh, starts to leak air, and it's starting to go down, and he's swimming out there, and the dad's getting tired, and nobody else seems to notice that she's drifted so far. The dad gets there, and the dad is weary, and they're stuck, and the waves are getting a little worse. And praise the Lord, the, the lifeguard who was on duty, he saw them out there, and he would swim out there and take some equipment out there and bring them back. But it's so easy as a Christian to drift away at times, to become dull spiritually. Now, I don't know what David was going through, so don't let me put words in his mouth. Let's just see what he said. My soul cleaveth unto the dust. David's result of a problem. David, it appears, begins this section of heartfelt prayer with a spiritual dryness. There are times when we are spiritually dry. Now, I'm going to do a little extra reading tonight and just some thoughts about Scripture. One thing that should be very important to you is God's Word. How important is God's Word to you? Last week we discussed this. This week we're going to discuss this. The important issue is that he understood it. Listen closely. We don't study the Bible to become so-called Bible scholars. That's not why we study it. Now, I, I hope you do, and I hope you become very wise in that area. That's not the point to study. 
then we don't study it simply to learn and follow the moral precepts, even though we should. Although we should do these things, we study the Bible to seek God Himself, learn of Him, His character, His ways, His plan. The Word of God brings us into spiritual life. And we're not going to turn to these scriptures, but John chapter 3 and verse 5, James, uh, I think chapter 1, and 1 Peter 1, 23, it sustains us. So when our heart grows cold, God is the author of life itself. His word has life-giving power. David recognizes that the word of God is the source of spiritual life and vitality. With this in mind, he makes these words. My soul cleaveth unto the dust. Quicken thou me according to thy word. There is a time, it seems, of spiritual lethargic. Um, you remember the story of Job. You remember Job got in a, got in a mess, right? And it, what, it had nothing to do with him. And yet, he lost everything. And uh, it would get to the point where his own wife would say, uh, curse God and die. <laughs> Uh, man, it's a rough, a rough time. Eliphaz would uh, tell him, uh, you don't fear God. That's why this has come upon you. Uh, you. You're sinning. Bildad would say, repent of the wrongs you've done. Zophar, you deserve this and worse. Job got to a point where he could no longer be spiritually comforted, it seems like. Got very depressed and discouraged. But David is at a point where he's struggling. Possibly in despair. He's in a very low state of mind, maybe feeling rejection. But notice what he does here. He recognizes his despair. He records his response. And he recognizes his strength. An emptiness overwhelms his spirit in this first verse. An emptiness deep inside of him. If you will, he was dull spiritually. There's a holy desperation. So what does he say? Quicken thou me. Quicken means to make alive. It doesn't mean he didn't ask God, God, comfort me. God, give me something to praise about. God, uh, you know, tell me something. No, he said, quicken me, make me alive. The benefit of being open and frank with God, listen closely, is spiritual recovery. Spiritual recovery. The benefit you have when you go before God, you're open and frank with Almighty God, you can get back close to Him. This is something we as Christians, sometimes slowly we drift away and, and then we slowly drift a little farther and pretty soon we're getting nothing out of our Bible. Sunday school is boring. Church services are boring. The worship time doesn't mean anything. We start slowly drifting away. And many times it's because we're not open and frank with God about the situations we are going through. He said, quicken thou me, make me alive according to thy word. It's a grand thing to see a believer in the dust and yet pleading the promise of Scripture. Um, I was doing a study in, in Deuteronomy, I forget what chapter, I think chapter 23, but it talks about recording the word of God and bringing it through. So David had some part of the Scripture. David had some part of the, 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 the Pentateuch. David had some scripture. And David said, make me alive according to your word. Your word is good enough for me. Notice the object of his pursuit. The object of his pursuit. The benefit of being open and frank with God is spiritual recovery. But notice the object of his spiritual pursuit. He said, according to thy word. Now notice in verse 26. Notice what David does here. I have declared my ways, and thou heardest me. Teach me thy statutes. Now what did David declare to God? Uh, some people believe he declared uh, the way that God desired for him to be. But I believe more or less he declared the mistakes that he was going through. He declared these ways to God. I have declared my ways. I've confessed. I've made open myself to you. And this is what you've done, God. You've kept up your end of the bargain. You heard me. You heard me. David said, I'm in a very low place. God, I need you to make me alive according to your word. So what have I done? I've declared my ways. I've been frank with you. I've opened myself up to you. And guess what happened? God heard. Thou heardest me. Then he says this. Teach me thy statutes. Uh, thou heardest me in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. 
I love this verse. This is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He what? He heareth us. He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. It is a comfort to know that I am heard. <laughs> Sometimes I get in trouble for not listening enough. <laughs> Are there any other husbands in the room who get in the same trouble? My, uh, sometimes I'll be going about my day and doing what I'm thinking I'm supposed to be doing, you know, working around, doing something, and Quest will come out, and she'll be telling me about this or that, and I need to do this, or she's encouraging me, whatever she's doing, and there are times where she'll say, Ben, listen to me. You're not listening to me. And uh, she'll say, what did I say? <laughs> and I know I'm always in trouble when she actually asked me what she really said. And she'll say, Ben, so what did I say if you listened to me the whole time? And I'll try to make something up quick, or I'll try to bring back to my mind something that she had said just to recall something. And then she usually she gets me. And then she says, Ben, look at me <laughs> as I'm talking to you. Pay attention. And I love that God hears me. David said, I've declared my ways. I've opened my heart. You heard me. Now what do I want from you, God? Teach me thy statutes. The idea of statutes, what you've declared in stone, what is a matter of permanence? Thy word is truth. Thy word is settled in heaven forever. Thy word is settled in heaven. The word that is truth. Declare unto me thy statutes. What is, I love this word, definitive. What is definitive? God, show me these things. This is what I desire. God, your direction in my life, I understand, will only come through your word. Look at verse 27, where we're talking about David's result of his problem. He was at a very low place. Verse 27, he's talking to God. This is his prayer. He said, make me to understand the way of thy precepts. So shall I talk of thy wondrous works. Make me to understand thy precepts. The word precepts is generally the idea of God's instruction or detail. I know some of these words can kind of be intertwined with one another, but they do have importance on their own. The word precept, God's instruction or detail. He said, make me to understand your instruction and your details, the little things. Why? Because David cared about God's direction. Many times, I was talking to a man the other day, and... Um, you know, telling me about uh, spiritual, we were trying to, I was trying to talk about spiritual things, and he kept talking about other things, and I kept bringing up this, and I kept bringing up that, and I asked him, so what's God's plan for this world? What's next? And he said, well, I, I, I think that we should all just, uh, I think we should all just stop yelling at each other, and we should just all get along. And I said, because he said at the, at the core of it, uh, he, he changed from as a world, but then he started going to religion. He said at the core of religion, we all believe the same thing generally. And so I asked him some questions about some things that should be true. And uh, he said, well, I, I, we shouldn't argue about that. We should just all uh, get along. And that was the end of the conversation. David said, God, make me to understand the way of thy precepts, your, your instruction, your details, so I can talk of your wondrous works. What are the wondrous works? Creation, providence, redemption, grace. With more knowledge, with more understanding, with more zeal, with more spirit, with more cheerfulness. Make me to understand so I shall talk of thy wondrous works. In verse 28, he said, My soul melteth for heaviness. The word melteth means uh, such like a candle would fall away and fade away. Uh, my soul, the idea of breath, my corrupt body is struggling with grief. My soul melteth for heaviness, this weight that's upon me. God, strengthen thou me according to thy word. According to thy word. What God has declared. Strengthen me according to thy word. When you're strengthened according to the Word of God, you can oppose corruptions, you can withstand temptations, you can bear under trials and afflictions, and listen closely, you can do the will of God. My friend, under the will of God, when we're melting for heaviness, when we're weak, our prayer should be, God, strengthen us according to your Word. Make us strong again. Make us able to defend Make us able to stand in truth and righteousness and holiness. This is the idea, I believe, David was saying, a willingness to endure 
anything you bring along. God, strengthen me according to your words so I can endure this. So I can endure this. Notice in verse 25 through 28, we see David's result of the problem. My soul cleaveth unto the dust. And he's asking God, give him wisdom, give him instruction. Look at verse 29, if you will. We'll get to the, the main part of the message tonight. Seems this to be the, the climax or the, the underlying problem. Remove from me the way of lying, the way of deceit, the way of shame. The way, of, uh, the way of this lying ideology here, if you will. The way of this shame, the deceit, the pain that comes with it. And grant me thy law graciously. At least this was part of the problem. I don't know David's full extent of the problem. You remember David in 1 Samuel um, chapter 21, maybe. He lied to Arioch and he lied to the king of Gath in the Philistine area, and he lied to him, and he pretended himself to be mad so he could get away. There were times where David revealed deceit. I don't know if that's what this is talking about particularly, but David makes his statement, remove from me the way of lying, that I may remain under your guidance. God, I think David was saying like this. I don't want to put words in David's mouth. God, remove from me this. God, give me a hatred for this thing that I know is against your law. Does God desire us to lie? No. Does God desire us to be deceitful? No. David is saying, God, completely remove it far from me. So I have nothing to do with it. So I can remain under your guidance. When we come to God, we must come on His terms. Of course, He tells us to come boldly with confidence. We ought to reckon God's law a gift and value it. David here, he said, God, grant me thy law graciously. David's prayer has been out of a heart of despair. Okay, does everybody see that so far? This heart of despair, understanding, God, help me to understand your precepts. God, teach me your statutes. God, strengthen me with your word. All of this has to do with what's written. Okay, all of this has to do with everything David has said so far. Now, what does David say he's going to do? Look at verse 30. Verse 30. David makes a declaration. I want you to see uh, David's deliberate choices here in verse 30. I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. Verse 30, we find there's a deliberate choice here. I have chosen truth. Friend, one does not fall into holiness and right living with God. One does not fall into it. One must deliberately decide that I am going to be holy. I have chosen the way of truth. I have chosen the way of truth. If there is any purpose, it will be marked by clear and definitive decisions. Uh, listen closely. It's not because there are no other ways. It is because we know all other ways lead to God's displeasure. David said, I have chosen, I've made a clear, definitive choice that I am going to follow the way of truth. What is truth? What is truth? God's Word. Is there any other truth outside of God's Word? Now, we understand, you know, we can say, you know, we can make a statement like, there are birds that fly around. Okay, yes, we understand that to be a true statement, but what is truth? Truth is what God said. Truth is what we stand upon. David said, I make a declaration. I'm deliberately choosing the way of truth. The word way means the path, the path of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. Uh, Spurgeon, uh, the old preacher once said, uh, commands of God must be set before us as a mark to aim at, to model to work by, or a road to walk in. David said, I've chosen this way of truth. I have laid out. Uh, it seems that David is saying he's laid out before him thy judgments, his commands, thy judgments, the, the word judgments is an interesting word. It means justice rooted in God's character. Justice rooted in God's character. Who God really is. David said, I have chosen the way of truth. I have laid out who you really are, God. And I plan to follow that. Deliberately. I've chosen. The question that David is going through and the problems he's struggling with, now he finally says, I have chosen. He's prayed these things. He's asked God for certain things. But now David said, 
I've chosen your way of truth. I've set your judgments before me. I have made these things a big deal in my life. Notice verse 31. I have stuck unto thy testimonies, O Lord, put me not to shame. Thy testimonies is the idea of the dependability of who God is and what He has said, the dependability of the Bible or His Word as a witness of things to God. The word stuck means to cling to. David is telling God, God, I chose the way of truth. We know truth to be His Word. I've laid out your judgments, what your character is before me. I understand who you are. I have firmly held on to your testimonies. The dependability I have upon you, O Lord, put me not to shame or bring me not to shame. God, I've held on to you even through the times when I've been through tough times. The times where he said I've been into the dust and ashes. Little Lucas, there are times where I'll uh, have him and I'll, I'll throw him in the air. And sometimes he laughs at it and sometimes he gets really nervous and he'll come down and he'll grab onto me. And sometimes he'll grab onto to my jacket when I bring him down. I hold him right here and he'll hold on to it. And if you know Lukey, he's got a grip. He clings to it. David is saying, I have stuck or I've clinged onto thy testimonies. Lord, put me not to shame. And notice, as a result of Dave's, David's deliberate choice, he chooses truth, he sticks to God's testimonies, and then in verse 32, what does he say? I will run the way of thy commandments, and thou shalt enlarge my heart. I will run in a certain direction. I will go on vigorously. I have truth, and I will move forward. My friend, as we go through Psalms 119, if God uh, keeps going through this chapter, if I feel that's where we're going to go, my friend, it's so important that there's some deliberation in our path for the truth of the Word of God. David here, this is his prayer, this is his plea. David is going through a tough time and he says, God, remove from me these things. God, help me not to even desire this. I don't want this sin of lying and deceit in my life. God, I don't want to have any pleasure in that. God, get that away from me. God, I choose you. I choose truth. I lay it before me. I stick to your testimonies. I run the way of thy commandments. And you've given me wisdom. I believe and I, I want to say this. It's going to sound a little strange, but I believe David is saying, not, not slow and cautious, I'm going full, full bore for you. There's deliberation. David had a problem. David made a deliberate choice. What was his deliberate choice? The way of truth. Sticking to the testimonies. Running the way of thy commandments. What David was dealing with here, I don't know. I can't tell you that for sure. One thing I do know is that David made God and his character and who he was utmost importance in his life. My friend, there are many times we don't know who God is. There are many times where we forget how capable God is to handle the situations. David prays this prayer, God, remove this. God, I'll do this. God, I'll do this. God, I'll do this. And then you know what God's going to do for David? David, God will tell, say of David, he's a man after my own heart. But David had to make some decisions. There was some deliberation in David's life. Friend, tonight, you need to make some deliberate decisions. I choose truth. Okay, we can't just say it. I, I get so sick of hearing about people who refuse to read the Word of God and apply it in their life. Man, we've got so much going on today and there's so much stuff and yet we refuse to go to the Bible for solutions. We refuse to take the truth of God's Word for our solution. And then when finally um, doing apologetics or defending the faith, if you will, um, there was somebody who came up and they made this statement. Pastor, how do we defend the faith, the Bible, when we go to people who don't believe the Bible? And it's interesting that for some reason in our minds we feel like we've got to know everything about every religion. No. No, you don't have to because you don't believe in those religions. What you need to know is the truth of the Word of God. So an answer to go to people who, who may not believe the Bible, uh, let me, I, I heard this illustration. We're so scared of using the Bible because people in our day and age don't believe it. And sometimes we feel intimidated if we quote it because there are some people who think this is a laughable book. But if this truly is a sword and people say, I don't believe it, 
you're not there to defend this. If you have to defend God and his word, we don't have a very big God and we don't have his true word. Okay, listen closely. There were two knights fighting, right? They came to one another and they had, both had big swords and they came and they were going to fight. And uh, one knight said to the other knight, he said, I don't believe your sword is sharp and I don't honestly believe that it's going to work. We have a couple options. Number one, he can either cut the man or he can put the sword away. And he can just allow them to attack him. It's the same with the Word of God. People say they don't believe it. We quote it. We study it. We believe it. We live by it. We trust it. His truth, His precepts, His law, His commandments. We apply them deliberately. And then we allow it to infiltrate our life, our lifestyle, our thinking. And then guess what? There is courage. There is confidence. There is boldness. And when people come and they shatter your faith, for instance, and they say, well, that could have never happened. Science teaches us this. We're firmly planted on what we believe. David knew he was going through a tough time in the dust, and he said, God, I'm keeping your law. God, I've laid your judgments before me. God, I've chosen the way of truth. God, I believe your testimonies. God, I stand behind it. I know who you really are, and I know what you gave me, and I trust it. Aren't you glad for a reliable source? Now we need to use it. We need to use it. We need to listen to it. And, oh, friend, during this time, as we continue on in the church, we're going to stand by the Word of God, and we're going to trust it, and we're going to use it, and we're going to read it, and we're going to study it, and we're going to apply it. And you know what we're going to do if something changes? We're going to take the Word of God, we're going to study it, we're going to read it, we're going to apply it, we're going to dig into it, we're going to trust it. And you know what if something changes? You get in the picture? We're going to use this book, and we're going to rely everything on God. Amen? That's where David was in his life. David was in a low place. Very low place. And uh, we need this, friend. We all need to rely on it. If there's ever been a time you need to be in Sunday school, it's now. If there's ever been a time you need to be in Bible studies, it's now. If there's ever been a time we need to be faithful to church, it's now. If there's ever been a time we need to start house churches, it's now. If there's ever been a time we need to get serious about teaching it and finding out about it and reading it and applying it and getting a buddy who will talk to us about what we read. and uh, Man, we need to get serious about this thing. It's our only hope. God is real and He gives us truth. And we use it like it's a doormat and every once in a while we'll wipe our feet on it just every once in a while. It's not like that. This is an everyday truth. Oh, the power behind it. What David believed about this book. There's never been a time as now that we need to be more involved in it. It needs to define us. And uh, my goodness, it needs to be preached and proclaimed and taught. Get a buddy. Find somebody to talk about it with. And uh, oh, so much. All right. Let's do this. Let's take time to pray tonight. Let's take our prayer list. Pray for these things. I hope you will. Pray for people who haven't been in church. We did this last week. I want you to look around. Think about somebody who hasn't been here in the last few weeks. Maybe you know why they haven't been here. Maybe you don't. And just pray for them. Just pray for them. You say, Pastor, I don't know what they're going through. Look around. And if God puts a name on your heart, write that name down. I'm putting one right now. For various reasons. Maybe they're not here. Maybe you know what's going on in their life. But pray for them tonight. Take one person. Everybody take one. And Lord willing, we'll all get somebody uh, different. We'll all pray for them. All right, let's split up to pray. Uh, let's get in small groups here and uh, just take your time. Pray. Be deliberate. Know you're entering the presence of the King and uh, talk to Him.